Jen Space, and thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, we are so, so excited to be doing another lecture in partnership with No Science, um, which is an international education and advocacy organization working to, to promote knowledge of science and scientific research to a non-specialized audience. We're so happy to have him here with us tonight. Um, to, to just tell you a bit about GenSpace, this is our executive director, Alan Jorgensen. Hi, how many have never been here before? Oh, so quite a bit, okay. So GenSpace is a community lab. That's a new type of entity. It's a, a working biotechnology laboratory that's not affiliated with either a university or a company. We're a standalone 501c3 nonprofit. And we were founded in 2009 by a bunch of people from very different backgrounds but all of whom wanted access to a bio lab. So we had some students that couldn't get any space in the labs in their school to work on projects that they had thought about rather than that was the professor's project. We had a bio artist who wanted to use the space for her work. Um, I'm a, a practicing molecular biologist and uh, I had actually been, at that time, I had been working for 10 years at a level where I was just directing people from afar and I, I wasn't actually in the lab and I kind of missed it. Uh, so, uh, just a, a very interesting group of people, including professional scientists, artists, writers, students, um, teachers. Uh, we have entrepreneurs that use the space. The space has um, a couple of different uses. One is it's, it's like a biohacker space or a maker space where um, for $100 a month you can be a laboratory member and have access to the space to do your own projects. Um, we don't really care what you do as long as it's safe and it's not horribly annoying, like makes a huge amount of noise or a big mess. Um, we have people that are working on very serious uh, biotech startups and people that are just doing it for their own education, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then we also do um, free things, lectures like this. Uh, we also do a lot of science fairs like the AAAS Family Science Day, Rockefeller Science Saturdays, uh, 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 Idea City, um, things like that, so street, street stuff. Um, and we also have classes that are very interesting um, for adults. They're geared for people that, like the last time they took any biology was in high school 20 years ago. Um, we don't assume any knowledge um, beforehand. Um, actually, there are a couple people here that have taken our classes. You want to say something about nice about them? <laughs> uh, very educational, very approachable, not too scary. And you uh, get to see a lot of your DNA come back from the uh, sequencing labs and we get to play with it with interesting with open source tools to look at your genes. And All our classes are hands on. So uh, we have classes in uh, basically uh, introduction to biotechnology that uh, is the one that he took that where you, you, you isolate DNA from yourself and you, you analyze it. Uh, also do some genetic engineering, um, some bacterial transformation and things like that. We also just started this CRISPR thing that's kind of overtaking everybody. But we have a workshop that's the prerequisite to um, a four session lab class where people are actually using CRISPR, which is this technology that's been in the news for genome editing, to, um, to do it hands on um, with yeast to do genome editing. So that's another thing. And we're going to be adding other classes, too, throughout this year. We're trying to expand our range of classes. And we have workshops, too, from guest people, everything from the Backyard Brains people with their robo-roach and, and um, the DIY neuroscience stuff to uh, we have a whole series on food this year. We have people that are making um, all sorts of fermented things like sauerkraut and beverages and stuff. And, uh, it's going to be very interesting. Just uh, there, everything's on the website, and if you want to be on our mailing list, there's on the front of the website. There's a box somewhere at the bottom that says register, and that's what you're doing. Uh, we are a nonprofit. We survive from donations and from the revenue from the classes and the memberships. We have a nice little jar here. If you want to stick in a few bucks for the lecture, we would love it. Should we you could if you wanted. So it sounds sort of like church, so. <laughs> I mean, if you want to, go ahead. But no one's going to come after you if you don't. Yeah. Um, 
And now uh, Allison yes. can introduce the speaker. So we're yeah. very excited to have because this is a topic everybody wants to know about. <laughs> What's the new one on? Yeah. So I would like to introduce our speaker for the evening, uh, Dr. Deepshika Ramanan. Shika is a graduate student at, at, at New York University. She received her BSc in Cell and Molecular Biology from Winona State University in 2008. During the summer of 2007, she was awarded a fellowship to perform undergraduate research at the, at the Mayo Clinic in the laboratory of Dr. Richard Brown, where she was introduced to, to immunology. To prepare for a career in science, she worked as a research technician in the laboratory of Dr. Edwin Chapman from 2008 to 2010, and then enrolled in the NYU School of Medicine Sackler Immunology and Inflammation PhD program. So we're very excited to have you, Shika. Thank Take you. Take it away. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So thank you all for being here. Um, and as Allison said, as Allison said, uh, my name is Shika Ramanan, you can call me Shika. And I work in the laboratory of Dr. Ken Cadwell at um, NYU School of Medicine. And also, um, we're, I'm from an organization called No Science, and it's a nonprofit organization also. Um, and you know, there's a great organization which gives opportunities for scientists like me to showcase our expertise and work to the public and we really enjoy doing science, and we really want to get everyone else excited about science, and that's basically what we're really doing in this organization. And uh, find us on social media, or on Facebook, on Twitter. We would really appreciate it if you could tweet about our talk today. Uh, find us at, at no underscore science, and please include the hashtag no science. Okay, so before I get started today, I want to ask you a question. When you hear the word bacteria, what is the first word that comes to your mind? Anybody? Antibiotics. Antibiotics, germs. Cultures, okay. infections. Cultures, yeah. infections. Bad. Bad. Two days. <laughs> Perfect. Here. <laughs> yes, very important. Um, so yeah, when most people think about bacteria or microbes, they think dirty, disease, bad, obsessively washing their hands, and think of them as these bad guys. But what if I told you that we have more microbes than cells in our body? I mean, before you go rushing for the hand sanitizer, let me tell you that we can survive without these bacteria. They're actually really good for us. And as this cover of The Economist uh, from 2015, I want to say, suggests microbes makes us who we are. And I'm going to tell you more in detail about how exactly it makes us who we are in the next few slides. And I do want to put a disclaimer out there about how many more microbes than cells we have in our body. The common notion was that we had 10 times more bacteria than cells in our body. But a study just came out a couple months ago, which was done based on the weight of bacteria and the weight of our cells. And apparently, the new ratio is more like 1.3 to 1. So still more bacteria than cells, but the ratio is kind of debated right now. It's under controversy. Um, but it's so fascinating that we're, even if we're just as much bacteria as cells, I mean, that's extremely fascinating. So what are these commensal bacteria? I mean, why do you think we need these bacteria? Any, any ideas? Digestion. Great. Don't they fight other bacteria? Great. I mean, you guys already know so much about this. Um, so the word commensalism, commensalism means when two organisms coexist with each other, and one organism benefits from this interaction, but the other one is not harmed. So here, the bacteria are not being harmed, but the organism that benefits from this relationship is us as people. And these bacteria, I mean, it's not just one type of bacteria that are commensal bacteria. There's many, like thousands and thousands of species that are commensal bacteria. And this mix of bacteria is what's called our microbiome. And throughout the talk, I will use commensal bacteria, good bacteria, and microbiome interchangeably. But these terms all mean pretty much the same thing. So what do these bacteria do for us? And as you said, one of their main functions is to shield us from bad bacteria. Um, a lot of you probably know about salmonella. Salmonella infections happen when you eat um, raw eggs or like, 
food that's not been properly cooked and it affects a lot of people and there's all these outbreaks that happen when you buy spinach or greens that haven't been properly cleaned and it affects thousands and thousands of people in the United States alone. And one, um, one thing that's very interesting is that these commensal bacteria, especially the ones that live in our intestine, they form a shield. They completely cover the surface of our intestine. So it makes it very hard for bad bacteria to come attack our system. Um, so first of all, they're forming this barrier. And in addition to that, they're fighting for the same nutrients that these bad bacteria are fighting for. And what ends up happening is in a lot of times, the good bacteria ends up fighting ends up winning over the bad bacteria. And that's why some most people actually do okay. Not, most of us here are not suffering from salmonella infections every day. But some people, unfortunately, tend to have fewer of these good bacteria, which I will get to later during my talk. And that's why they're more prone to such infections. And recent studies have shown that these commensal bacteria can also make their own antibiotics. And these antibiotics selectively target more pathogenic bacteria, but there's still a lot of research that remains in that area. So we're still not sure exactly why they're making these antibiotics, but it's known that these, uh, some of these species can even make their own antibiotics. Um, and as Allison said, these bacteria help us digest our food. I mean, in fact, a lot of the things that we eat, we can't digest if we didn't have these bacteria in us. And the saying, you know, the most popular saying, you are what you eat, has more truth to it than you think, because depending on what you eat, you have a different mix of bacteria in your intestine. And they've done a lot of studies in obesity and other metabolic disorders where they found that people that are obese have a completely different composition of these good bacteria compared to people that are not. And they've done these studies in twins where they take some, uh, take the sister who tends to be more obese and transfers their bacteria into the skinnier sister and the skinnier sister will now also become obese. And they've also done vice versa where they take uh, the bacteria from the skinny sister and put it into uh, the more obese sister and the obese sister will now become more lean. Mm -hmm. So these studies, again, these have been done in, yes? Sorry, is this a bad time? No, <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> is this, are, you, are we talking about like a fecal transplant? Yes, uh, okay. it, it, it is. How did they get children to volunteer for that? It's not children, actually, they were adults, and there were only three groups of twins, so okay. it's, it's harder. Like, with human studies, three is apparently uh, a good enough number for statistical significance, so uh, they got away with that. But they've done a lot of studies like this in the mice, too, where they take uh, the bacteria from obese mice and put it into skinny mice and then take bacteria from skinny mice and put it into obese mice and they see the same thing. But yes, they, the reason why they did it in twins is because genetically, they're extreme, I mean, they're, they didn't want to like monozygotic twins, so they're exactly the same in terms of genetic composition, so that's why they did it in that part, but yeah. Um, so yes, let me then ask you a quick question. How many of you have seen this movie, <laughs> Bubble Boy, with Jake Gyllenhaal? Um, <laughs> so if you haven't seen it, this is basically a movie about this guy who doesn't have an immune system, so he has to live in a bubble, and he falls in love with the girl, and then it makes everything very complicated. But basically, if we don't have these bacteria in our intestines or on us, we're, we would have to live in bubbles like this because these bacteria play a major role in schooling our immune system. So if we don't have these bacteria, we have very poorly developed immune systems and we can't fight a lot of infections. Again, we can't digest our food. And what I mean, um, what I mean by saying they school the immune system is that they help the immune system figure out what is the difference between good bacteria and bad bacteria. As I told you, we're just as many cells as bacteria, so how does our body not constantly keep attacking them? It doesn't because it's able to recognize the difference between a good bacteria and a bad bacteria. But how exactly our immune system is able to achieve that is under studies right now. I mean, we don't really know how our immune system does that, but there's a lot of research going on trying to understand how exactly that happens. And again, in terms of metabolism, I already told you, depending on the commensals you have, your metabolism might be faster or slower. Um, when you're younger, your, your 
gut bacteria tend to have more bacteria that are faster in metabolism, and when you tend and, and as you get older, we tend to lose some of this bacteria, and that's why, you know, they say when you hit 30, everything goes downhill. It's possible that that it's because we've started losing our good bacteria, and we can no longer metabolize our food as well as we did when we were teenagers. And another really interesting thing. Uh, oh, sorry. Before I before I um, go to the next section, um, one a few studies have also shown that the gut bacteria, the bacteria that live in your intestine, can really affect your brain function. So there is a whole new field of study known as the psychobiotics, where they're trying to find bacteria that will make you feel better. And you know this kind of brings the idea. Well, do your gut microbes really induce that gut feeling that you have? Is that because of the microbes in your intestine, and people are studying that right now as well. And another really interesting point is that we each have a different microbiome. Like You can think of it as a fingerprint, just like how two people in this room don't have the same fingerprint, two people in this room don't have the same microbiome. And, I mean, I told you, they've done all these studies in twins too. Even if you are genetically the exact same, their microbiomes are pretty different. And um, while, while it's pretty different, there are still similarities in terms of the microbiome when you look at families. So people that live together tend to have microbiomes that are closer to each other than, than your neighbors, for example. And people that have pets, um, like dogs or cats, tend to have microbiomes that are also similar to their pets because you know you kiss your dog and then you get all the microbes from your dog or your cat. And this is all, in a way, really good for you because you're increasing all the diversity in your bacteria. Now, let me ask you another question. Which parts of your body do you think you have commensal bacteria in? Skin. Skin. Not your brain. Not your brain, that's true. Brain's very st in a sterile environment. Anywhere else? Stomach. <laughs> the stomach, the gut, exactly. But the skin, the gut are only a couple places. We actually have um, like ecological colonies of these bacteria in many different parts of our bodies. Now, you can think of it as, um, we can take an example of forests, right? We have dry forests, we have rainforests, we have different kinds of forests. So think of, and just as much as the forests are different, the animals and the birds that live in these forests are going to be extremely different. And similar to this, the bacteria that live in different parts of our body are very different. So if you look at the bacteria that live in your intestine, they're completely different from the bacteria that live on your skin, because your skin is very dry and your intestine is very wet. And similarly, bacteria that live in your mouth and in your armpits tend to be very different from bacteria, for example, that live in your organs, such as your lungs and your uterus. Now, this raises an important question. So what decides what microbiome we have? Where do we get our microbiome from? So we all get our microbiomes from our mothers um, as we pass through the birth canal and as we're being born is when we get colonized by these trillions of bacteria. And I always had this question, you know, because I've been fascinated. How is it that you're a baby, you're born in a sterile environment, and then somehow you come out and you're colonized all of a sudden with the trillions of bacteria from your mothers, and yet you don't have this immune response that's, you know, causing all of these um, allergies or effects on you. And apparently a lot of labs are studying that right now, so I'm glad, but we don't know the answer to that yet. Um, but what happens sometimes is there's changes in the amount of good bacteria to bad. So we have trillions of species, or trillions of bacteria in different parts of our body, but sometimes the composition of these different species goes up or down. And in some people, these may be very bad. So if you have fewer good bacteria on your skin because you started using a new face wash and that didn't you know, agree with your skin, or you started eating something that you went from being extremely um, healthy and eating fruits and vegetables and you started eating fast food all the time, all of this has a big impact on not just your gut bacteria, but also your skin bacteria, the bacteria that live in all different parts of your body. And what happens is you make yourself more susceptible to a lot of these diseases. So when you have less good bacteria on your skin, all of a sudden you develop conditions like acne and eczema. And when you have um, a loss of these good bacteria in your intestine, 
you tend to have, you tend to be more susceptible to diseases such as malnutrition, um, gastric ulcers, obesity, <laughs> diabetes, and also inflammatory bowel diseases, which is my specialty. So later on in the talk, I will kind of focus more on inflammatory bowel disease. So the question is, well, what causes changes to the microbiota? If we got it from our mom, what's changing this? So there's a lot of factors that change this, one of which is your genetic makeup. So our genetics is what we get from our parents. We get one copy of each uh, chromosome from our parents, and that's our genetic makeup. And as you may all have heard, there are several mutations, like all of us have several mutations. I mean, it's mutations that give rise to eye color, to hair color, to height, and all of these things are dependent on mutations in your gene, right? So these mutations, while they're good in some ways, they can also be bad in some ways where they can increase susceptibility to cancer. And these good and bad bacteria, the ratio of them also depends on these genetics. Now the other most important factor that changes your microbiome is your lifestyle, such as diet and stress. It has been shown that people that eat more vegetables, fruits, and have a diet that's rich in fiber tend to have more good bacteria compared to people that eat more processed foods or eat foods, um, or fast foods, for example. Um, and one um, area of interest that is slowly coming up is early colonization which is uh, birth in hospitals. So they have shown, which is quite fascinating, that depending on whether you were born by a C-section or a vaginal birth has a big effect on your microbiome because when you're born by a C-section, you end up getting the microbiome from your mother's skin. And that's very different, as I told you, from getting the microbiome from the mother's vagina, which has a completely different microbiome. And what ends up happening is apparently kids that are born by a C-section tend to be more prone to allergies and asthma, and they think that this is because of early colonization by the microbiota from during birth. So now, in hospitals, apparently you can ask when you, if you are having a C-section to have your baby smeared with fluids during, during birth so that the baby is exposed to all the commensals from the mother um, so it prevents asthma and allergy. There was just a study that came out, I think two weeks ago, that said that babies that were smeared with all of the fluids did not develop asthma or allergies as much as babies that were not 10 years later. So this study took a long time to do, but there seems to be some proof of principle to this um, idea. And finally, one very important thing is the use of antibiotics. So antibiotics are very, very important when we have infections. But a lot of people take antibiotics when we don't really need to. For example, when you get the cold, there's so many people that take antibiotics for colds. Colds are mostly caused by viruses, and you, antibiotics have no effect against viruses. But what ends up happening is antibiotics are broad spectrum, so they don't just kill the bad bacteria. They also end up killing all the good bacteria in your intestine. And this then again makes you more susceptible to all of the diseases I just talked about. And another problem with antibiotic use is you end up making um, a lot of resistant bacteria. A lot, and the pathogenic bacteria tend to evolve quicker and tend to develop resistance quicker than commensal bacteria. And this becomes a huge public health problem because the more resistant bacteria you have, the harder it becomes to you know, protect yourself from it and protect others from it. So antibiotic use is good when you need it, but you should really stop yourself from using it if you don't really need to. But apart from all of these reasons, there are also a lot of theories out there as to why you have changes in your microbiome. And one of them is known as the hygiene hypothesis theory. And this theory states that you know, improved hygiene and sanitation have decreased the diversity of microbiota. And what the diversity of microbiota here means is that I told you there's thousands of different species. So even though you have a trillion bacteria, if you have increased diversity, you may have 3,000 species of bacteria. If you have decreased diversity, maybe you only have 1,000 of them. So you've lost 2,000 species, which may have a big effect on you know, the microbiome in your body. So one of the reasons for this loss in diversity, again, is because of excessive antibiotic use in early childhood and also later on in life, but later on in life might have less effects compared to the ones you get early during early childhood. And another 
very important um, thing that the hygiene hypothesis theory states is that the presence of parasites, um, are you all aware about intestinal parasites? They're worms that live in your intestine. We evolved with these worms for hundreds of years, but then people in America, for example, don't have as many worms. Uh, maybe you guys have pets that have worms and you give them deworming treatment and stuff, and I will touch on that a little bit. But basically the theory states that when you don't have these parasites, you have less diversity of bacteria in your intestine. And there's some statistical correlation that shows that. So here's a map showing the incidence of autoimmune diseases and the incidence of helminth infection. So helminths are these intestinal parasites. So you can see that countries that have a high incidence of autoimmune diseases, which are in red, seem to have low incidence of helminth infections, right? And countries that have high incidence of helminth infections seem to have very low incidence of autoimmune diseases. I mean, keep in mind this is a statistical correlation, right? But I was very interested when I saw this because I'm actually from India. I moved here for college and India's right here. And as you can see, we have high incidence of <coughs> helmets. And I know as a kid that I had helmets just like all my classmates did, just like everyone in my family did, right? And I came here and I have obviously lost these helmets because I'm not, I'm not exposed to them here. So I was very interested in looking at what ha like, what happens. Like, is this really true? Do we really need parasites? Um, so I start, there's also anecdotal evidence here um, where a professor at NYU um, that I work with very closely followed this one person who had severe inflammatory bowel disease. He went to Thailand and he had heard this hygiene hypothesis theory. So he went to Thailand bought some worms off of the black market, and gave, him, gave it to him, himself, and what happened is he went into remission. And then he came to my professor and he was like, look, you need to study me because I got better after taking worms, so this is true. Now, disclaimer, do not do this at home, right? <laughs> there were a lot of side effects that happened because he took worms and he didn't have a doctor actually monitoring him. So please don't try to do that. But, um, since our lab is interested in intestinal diseases, we started looking at parasites in this aspect. So our lab is primarily interested in studying Crohn's disease and why people get Crohn's disease. So Crohn's disease is a chronic inflammatory bowel disease, uh, which occurs in, it can occur anywhere in the gastrointestinal tract, uh, but it most commonly occurs in the small intestine. And the most common symptoms include stomach pain, diarrhea, rectal bleeding. It's Really, really bad. I know a lot of people that have uh, Crohn's disease because they come to our lab to get themselves tested, and it is really, really sad, especially a lot of kids that have them. They all have colostomy bags, which are bags that direct their intestinal contents into a little bag, and they have to walk around with that. They can't go to school. They can't play outside. It's really, really sad. And this really motivated me further to work on this problem, right? And here's what an intestine of a healthy person looks like. This is a small intestine. And then here's what the intestine of a person with Crohn's looks like. And you can see that they have all of these like ulcers, perforations, and a lot of these people develop um, fusion of their organs where their small intestine can fuse with itself or fuse with other organs in the body and they need to have all of this removed. So it's, it's really, really sad. Um, so what causes Crohn's disease? So there's several factors that um, cause Crohn's disease, one of which is family history genetic susceptibility, as I told you before, this is what you get from your parents. Um, environmental factors, such as maybe fast food, your diet, um, dysbiosis. Dysbiosis just means this ratio of good bacteria to bad bacteria, and uh, parasites maybe. Um, and smoking, smoking actually increases your susceptibility to Crohn's by 40%. So that's something to think about. If there is a smoker in this audience, it's, it, it's really not good. So, okay, so how do we study Crohn's disease in our lab? Um, we actually study Crohn's disease using mice. We also do some work in people, but it's really hard to get people to agree to do these studies, so we mostly focus on mice. And we have mice that have the same mutation as people do. Um, and this mutation is called NOT2. About 25% of people that have Crohn's disease have this mutation, and we made mice that have this exact same mutation, and they also develop disease. So 
Um, when I joined uh, my lab, I basically wanted to understand, so how, how do you know, genetic factors, such as this mutation, interact with bacteria or parasites to influence disease susceptibility? Um, and what I found is that, first of all, the mice that I told you are very sick. They have very different commensal bacteria from healthy mice. Um, and there was one species that I identified in these mice called Bacteroides vulgaris. We'll just refer to that as bad bacteria from now on. But I don't want you to think it's bad because most of us in this room have this bacteria. And this bacteria is good for us if we don't have the NOT2 mutation. But if you do have the NOT2 mutation, then this bacteria may be bad. Um, and here's an experiment that I did, which um, what I did is I took uh, the intestine of a healthy mouse and I imaged it, and by image it, I mean um, I stained for different things. So what you're seeing here in green is bacteria in your intestine. And as you can see, there's tons. I mean, this is in mice, not human. But still, it's uh, pretty comparable. There's a lot of bacteria in the intestine. And this is the intestine here. This is the bacteria. And this black layer is the mucus that separates the bacteria from the intestine. But if you look in the sick mice, you can see that the separation is kind of gone now. It's all messed up. And there's this one orange bacteria, I don't know, if, yeah, you can see it, right? So there's a lot of this orange bacteria, and that's the bad bacteria that I identified. And there seems to be a lot of it in the sick mouse. Now, if I were to get rid of that bad bacteria in the sick mouse, the mice did get better. And we wanted to see, well, what is it that the bacteria is doing in these mice? Why are these mice getting sick when they have this bacteria? And there's another experiment that I did where what you're seeing here is a goblet cell. So a goblet cell are the cells in your intestine, in your lungs, that make mucus. And each of these circles that you see are the mucin granules that become your mucus. So the cell secretes this, and this, uh, in, addition, in combination with water, becomes a gel-like mucus layer in your intestine and your lungs. And so these cells are very important in our body. And what happens is, in the sick mice, they don't have as many of these granules. Um, and what we found is that the bacteria was causing the mice to have fewer of these granules, which then resulted in that horrible mucus layer that you saw, it was all distorted. And so that bacteria was then able to then um, reach the intestine, as you can see here, and then it was attacking the intestine, and that's why um, these mice were so sick. So basically, what we found is that if you are healthy, your intestine, in your intestine, everything is good. The bacteria are you know, happy, separated from the tissue by the mucus layer. But then if you're a sick mouse, you tend to have this one bacteria that grows out, which then causes this defect in this one cell in your body. And then you no longer have this mucus layer, so the bacteria are able to get close to the tissue affecting um, the intestine and causing all of these um, ulcers and things that you saw. So now we have this association between bacteria and a mutation. But I told you I was most interested in studying do we really need worms or not? So we thought this would be a good way to study worms because what if we gave these mice worms? Would they get better now? Because that's what I really wanted to see, right? So we used two types of worms. Um, the white worms that are here and the red worms that are there. So this is the intestine of the mice, and you can see those worms sticking out of the intestine, right? They're pretty big, but I'm gonna show you that they're actually good for you. Um, so what we found is that the mice got completely better when I gave them worms. It didn't matter what kind of worm I gave them, the mice got better. Um, and they got better pretty quickly. Like 20 days after, they were completely fine. It's like the mice, was not, the mice were not sick at all. Um, and then I wanted to find out, well, how did the mice get better? And I will cut the long story short and tell you that the reason why the worms were good for the mice is that they changed the populations of good and bad bacteria. So what they did, what happened in these mice is the bacteroides, which I told you was bad for uh, when you have the noctuid mutation, um, the bacteroides went down when you gave worms. But there was this species of, or there was this other bacteria known as Clostridia, which I will refer to as the good bacteria, which went up in these mice. Um, and we thought, okay, this is just in mice, but what about people? Um, 
Luckily for us, the UN has this uh, global campaign where they're trying to get rid of worms in a lot of rural populations. Um, because keep in mind that worms also have other side effects, right? So the UN is really trying their best to get rid of worms in a lot of populations. And we saw, we, it just so happened that we were working with this group of people um, known as the Orang Asli in Malaysia. So they're an indigenous tribe, and they live far removed from the city, um, and they have their own practices. And um, they actually are chronically infected with parasites, a lot of different types of parasites. And we were there at the right place at the right time, so we were able to look at, the, um, at their um, fecal samples before and after they were treated by the UN with this um, treatment that gets rid of parasites, also known as albendazole. Again, if you guys have pets at home, you may have given your pets albendazole to get rid of their uh, worm infections. It's the exact same medicine that's given to people to get rid of your worm infections. So we were able to get samples from about 150 people, 150 of these people, before and after they were treated with this medicine. And guess what we found? When these people had worms in their intestine, they had an increase in the good bacteria. But what happened when they got, when the worms were gone? They had more of the potentially bad bacteria. So we then thought, okay, why don't we go look at the data that's already been looked at in the US? So there was the Human Microbiome Project. I don't know if you're aware of that, but they basically collected fecal samples from a lot of people across the United States, and they looked at what was there, what kinds of bacteria were there in their stool. So we took that data, and we tried to find these bacteria, and we didn't have to look very hard. What we found is that people living in the US had a lot more of the potentially bad bacteria and a lot less of the good bacteria. Now, this is not necessarily bad, right? I mean, I told you this potentially bad bacteria is only bad for you if you, if you also have the mutation. The, all of these bacteria are commensal bacteria, so in some way or another, they're all good for you. But somehow, when you have certain mutations or a certain genetic susceptibility, some of them tend to become bad. Okay, now after saying all of that, how can you maintain more good bacteria in your intestines or on your body. First thing is don't be obsessively clean. Let your kids play on the floor, let them get dirty, follow the five second rule, maybe make it a 10 second rule. Um, I don't know. Just, just don't, don't just obsessively use hand sanitizer. Um, a lot of the antibacterial soaps that you have have triclosan in them and they will kill all the good bacteria when you use them. So don't be so obsessive. It's good to be clean, mm. but it's also sometimes good to be a little bit dirty. What's a good soap? What's a good soap? Yeah. Well, generally, most soaps will kill bacteria, but try to maybe use something that doesn't have triclosan in it. You can see in the ingredients. Triclo, okay. A lot of, a lot of products actually have triclosan in them. Yeah. Um, and you know, maintain a healthy diet. Eat, eat healthy. It's. I mean, I know we all crave McDonald's once in a while, one a.m. sometimes after <laughs> after a long day of work. I, I know I do, or chicken nuggets. I don't know. Uh, but but you know, try to in general eat a lot of fruits. Eat foods that are rich in fiber. Uh, they've shown they've been shown to promote good bacteria in your intestine. Go work out. Exercise. Um, exercise actually. They have already done these studies where they've shown that exercise also promotes a healthy microbiome in your gut, and it also helps relieve stress. It's good for a lot of reasons. So exercise. Um, don't take antibiotics when you don't need to. Please only take it when you when it's really necessary. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there um, called probiotics in yogurt, um, in a lot of fermented fruit foods that GenSpace says they were working on. They all have probiotics. I will say that it's not really known whether probiotics are really beneficial for you or not, but studies are on the way. We'll find out soon enough if they're good for you or not, but at least we know at this point they're not bad for you. So if, if you uh, have, are adding a lot of probiotics in your food, just keep doing that. Um, and take home message basically is that you know this diversity of the good bacteria I told you is important for health. And it's all about keeping a balance, right? Like balance between being clean and being dirty. It's, it's never good to be on the extreme ends of, 
of, of anything you do. Balance is key to everything in life. And it's the same with uh, the bacteria in your gut. You want to try to maintain a balance as much as, po as, much as possible. And uh, obsessive cleanliness weakens our immune system. So yeah, uh, just a healthy balance is important for that. And I was going to say, I mean, next time you think you're alone, think again, because <laughs> you are never alone. You are more than you think. It's billions of you all at once. So yeah, I, I love this question. Um, and, um, Finally, um, we have more No Science events coming up on April 28th. Uh, right here, we have a talk on obesity by Barry Levine, so please come to that. And also, again, we're a nonprofit organization, so please donate because our organization runs on donations from people like you. Um, they are tax deductible, so please donate um, because, as you know, this event is free, and we can't continue having events like this if we don't have donations from you guys. So. Now you can join us for some wine and snacks and any other questions you guys have. Any questions? Yeah. So back to the concept of obesity, back to the twins thing, <laughs> like, and then to the, the birth mother. So, is there a correlation of like obese women giving birth to then children who become obese because of that's the cultures a, they were born with? That's a really good point. I don't think those studies have been done. Because they say like, yeah. you know, we, we look like our parents in ways and yeah. we share body types, like, yeah. you know, structurally and <laughs> maybe it's all highly bacterial. Maybe, maybe this genetic concept of like, you look like your parents is not so much your DNA as it is well, your culture. Well, your DNA does play a huge role in what you look like. So, so I won't I won't say it's all bacteria because I mean everything like, everything but like your eye color, your hair, everything's determined by your DNA, right? Yeah. And your DNA could probably also determine what bacteria you're going to get colonized by. Because as I said, I think it's more what DNA you have may affect what bacteria you have as opposed to what bacteria you have affecting the other right. way around. Right. So I think, yeah. 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 Okay. Actually, can I just one? Yeah. Um, so the, the adding the, the helmets, the worms to your mice. Yeah. Um, do you have any idea about what the mechanism is that's inhibiting the, um, the bad bacteria? Yeah, so, so we know that, um, so, this is going into immunology. I don't know yeah. how much okay. immunology you know, but so worms induce a type of immune response known as a type two immunity, and which is different side effects from what's produced with a bacterial infection. And we know that it's because of that um, immune response that actually induces uh, goblin cells to produce mucus. And what happens is the good bacteria, Clostridia, tend to grow better in mucus. And they have an antagonistic relationship with this bad bacteria, so they're able to kick it out. Okay. Why is it just as simple as inducing mucus production then? Yeah, I mean, it is, well, but then you won't get the mucus production without the type 2 response, actually. Oh, okay. So if yeah. you induce the type 2 response in another way, it should have the same. So, yes, absolutely. So if I take the mice and just give them cytokines and not worms, uh -huh. right? If I just give them the cytokine that I told you, um, they will get better. Okay. But what we're trying to say is you maybe don't need, to, you don't need to take worms or take cytokines. You could just give yourself Clostridia, which is a good bacteria, and that might make you better. In fact, there is a company right now that just got funded by Janssen, which is a huge biotech company, um, that is working with the same bacteria that we just showed in our paper. Um, they're, they're working with the same bacteria, giving that to people, not just to treat IBD, but also arthritis and a bunch of other uh, autoimmune diseases. Huh. So the second question was, um, you mentioned uh, the microbiome change in age. Has anyone attempted an old to younger vice versa transplant? So uh, transplant, no. But you know what? I was telling, uh, I was telling my boyfriend the other day that I think I want to start banking something, banking yeah. um, fecal samples, so that when I get older and my metabolism slows down, I mean, maybe I can keep giving it to myself and I keep staying the way I am now. Maybe I don't know. I don't know if that's gonna work. But that's definitely something I've thought about too. Yeah. yeah. So did you cure Crohn's disease? So. Um, with people that have Crohn's disease with certain mutations, right? 
Um, there's more than 140 mutations that cause Crohn's. Only 25% of people that have Crohn's have the mutation um, that I, I worked with. And also, we have not, it could, so this health and therapy, or giving plus treatment could potentially work for those people. So what we're trying to say is that therapy for treatment for diseases like Crohn's needs to be tailor-made. So you need to find out what mutation someone has and then decide what therapy they get as opposed to just giving generalized therapy to everybody. Because that's why a lot of people, so right now, a lot of people that have Crohn's just get antibiotics, broad spectrum antibiotics. And most people are not cured by that. And the, the reason is probably partly this, like you wanna kind of figure out what mutation they have and then tailor make the therapy for them. So um, I've heard that uh, some bacteria uh, produce neuropeptides and, yeah. and other <coughs> yeah. brain type mm -hmm. chemicals. Is there any research that shows uh, which types of bacteria produce which? So there's things? some there's some evidence of that. Um, so some bacteria make short chain fatty acids. Um, so basically, a lot of the things that we eat, for example, coconut oil has, or coconut, coconuts in general, have a lot of medium chain fatty acids, and other foods have short chain fatty acids, and we can't process all of these without the bacteria in our gut. So they break them down, right? And a, a paper just came out showing that without these fatty acids, your uh, microglia in your brain, which are a very important neuron uh, in your brain, don't develop as well, and they don't function as well if you don't have um, the bacteria in your gut making these short chain or medium chain fatty acids. So is this direct correlation? I mean, or indirect at least. It's indirect, yes, but yeah. How do they decide what bacteria goes into probiotics? Well, so it depends, right? There's a lot of bacteria out there. And to tell you the truth, there's thousands of species and we barely know about like a hundred of them. There's so many species that we still haven't identified. We don't know what they're doing because we don't know how to study them. We don't know how to um, culture them. We haven't figured that out yet. So even though we've been studying the microbiome for like a couple of decades now, this field is still in its infancy. So we don't know. That's why I said in terms of probiotics, there's a lot of stuff out there, but we don't know whether it's beneficial or not because, well, we, know, we don't know whether it has no effect or if it's beneficial. We know it's not bad for you, but... Well, yeah, I can't tell you what you're supposed to, what bacteria specifically you should eat, because we, we don't know what a lot of these bacteria are eating yet. <clears throat> I was curious about your mouse gut imaging and yeah. how that compares to human colonoscopies. Like, what can you see when you're actually inside doing a scope in a human as opposed to all the dye work? That you're doing? So the dye work is, you have to fix the intestine for that, so they can't do that with people, right? But, yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. but what, what um, we have done that with biopsies from people, because mm -hmm. a lot of times when you have colonoscopy or endoscopy, they take pinch biopsies, um, mm -hmm. they ask you if they can, mm -hmm. and if you consent to it, then they will take pinch biopsies, and they will give it to labs like us, mm -hmm. so we can study this, um, and. I have looked at, for example, some of these biopsies, and you can use these dyes, because the bacteria that I showed you, even though they're in mice, they did come from some person at some point into these mice. Um, someone that probably takes care of these mice, uh, because it is a human species, even though we found it in mice. Um, so yeah, we can see those bacteria if we do that. Yeah, go ahead. Fantastic presentation. Um, I was just curious about um, you. You mentioned that obsessive cleanliness can be uh, a, a very negative thing, which uh, I, you know, I think it's a. <laughs> I, I hate cleanliness. <laughs> uh, probably the last decade, there's been a massive influx of um, these sort of liquid alcohols um, implemented into hospitals. Yeah. Um, where you need to sort of wash your hands right. with patients has massively decreased cross infection and, and, and most kind of right. infections in right. patients. Right. Has it, is there any work that's been done to look at has it actually negatively affected hospital stuff? So, as far as I know, it has not negatively um, associated that, right? Because 
So think about it. The doctors are constantly working with pathogenic bacteria. They're not really working with commensals. And you don't want to take a pathogenic bacteria from one person and give it to the other. So it's good. So again, it's all about balance. Like if you go to a hospital to visit someone and say, yes, wash your hands. Like use the hand sanitizer that's there. Right? But I'm just Oh, no, no, I understood. What, what I'm saying is, um, you know, so I've worked in hospitals for years. Right, right. You, you've got to sort of wipe right, your hands with right, these things. Which, right. So there will be a point where if I was busy, I'll be seeing 30 patients a day, 30 times. I'm right. My so, are you, so you're asking if the, if the doctors themselves exactly. have, have increased, you know, they have lost their commensal or something. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. And um, could we look at... You know, I'm just, I'm that, it could be done very, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> awesome. It could be looked at very easily, right? We could look at what they have, like a resident or like an intern, and then see what happens by the time they're an attending. Exactly. Like, like what happens to their skin microbiome? Yeah, that's really interesting. Maybe I can suggest that to one of our professors, and we'll take that on. <laughs> so what is the speculation for the uh, manganese that worm changes the population of bacteria? So, so the way it does it, as I said, is because of this type 2 immune response. So worms, when you have worms, you automatically use a type 2 immune response. That's just how your body reacts to the presence of the worm itself. And so when you have this response, you have um, increased goblin cells, which are the cells that I showed you that make mucus in your intestine. And this good bacteria tends to grow better in, um, in the presence of mucus. And the bad... The, I don't want to keep calling it bad, but the potentially bad bacteria um, can, doesn't, it, it's not that it um, grows worse, there's no difference in terms of how well it grows in mucus, but because this other bacteria uh, grows better, it outcompetes this um, potentially bad one and kicks it out. Awesome. Cool, well thank you so much. Yeah, That's thank great. you. Yeah, let's get